I just, uh, I don't know. I uh, am just trying to figure it out as I go, and I think that's what all of us do. But one thing I do know is I, I am prepared to give an answer to everyone who wants to know the reason and the hope I have. So the, the lesson's called Prepared to Answer. So let's say a prayer, and let's look at the scriptures. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for this time. I just pray, God, that uh, as we really open our hearts to your word and, and, and listen as your spirit guides us in your truth, uh, just thank you, God, for every single person who has the ability to grasp the faith needed to, to believe in you and in the, in the truth of eternal life, in the, in the understanding that you have all our hand, all our lives are in your hands. You control all things. You allow or cause all things to happen. You allow unfortunate circumstances to come upon us, but because we have the faith to know you're a good God, and we may not understand all the reasons from a human reason standpoint, we still can trust in you because you are love. You say another name for you, God is love. And I just pray that no matter what's going on, we can continue to be prepared to answer for the hope we have. We love you, it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So let's look at uh, Matthew 27, verse 45. Okay, uh, it says here, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which really, he's saying, why have you abandoned me? Uh, when some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with wine and vinegar, put it on a staff, and ordered, offered, excuse me, offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks split, the tombs broke open, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and explained, exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. You know, I always look at this because a lot of times, even as, uh, as Christians, uh, you need to remember the, the significant things that happened along with Jesus dying on the cross. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's pretty incredible. It was, you know, the death was accompanied by at least four miraculous events. Wow. Complete darkness, not just a cloudy day, complete darkness. Yeah. Uh, the tearing of the curtain in the temple, which was very thick, it was yeah. the temple which you couldn't, you couldn't do it. So that blew all the Jew, Jewish people that were there. They would really, this is the final plan of God, Jesus. Yeah. The dead people rising from the tombs. Yeah. Jesus' death, therefore, could not have gone unnoticed. Everyone knew something significant had happened. And even the guard, the people guarding him, when the centurion said this, he goes, oh my gosh, surely he was the son of God. Yeah. But see, we look at that, and that, that is truth, and God put that in there. You have a couple things you could say as a person that's studying or seeking God. You'd say, well, it's easier for them if I was there mm, yeah. and saw that. No, no, then you have a problem with believing God. Yeah. So that's what you're saying. If you're saying I need to, I, I need to be there if I was there. Well, Thomas, the doubting Thomas said that. He goes, if I, if I'm not believing he came back unless I put my fingers in his, in the nail marks yeah. 
and my hand in his side. And Jesus even says, blessed are you, after, after he does it again, he comes back and shows himself and says, blessed are you, Thomas, because blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Yeah. So see, if you say, I need to be there, no, then you, you don't understand the point of God's word, why it was carried along through the centuries by spiritual people that who wrote the Bible down. Yeah. All scriptures God breathed. So let's look at that scripture just to make sure everybody understands as we go on, because this is very powerful, that when we read anything, you, you don't have to be back there. The real question is, do you believe God at his word? Because if you don't believe the Bible, then you can't believe God at his word. Right. Um, and if you look at 2 Peter, on, Chris. look in 2 Peter, in verse... Um, uh, I'm sorry, um, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. He's talking about something, and if we look in verse uh, 16, here's Apostle Peter, 30 some odd years still living the life as a disciple of Christ on earth after Jesus had ascended into heaven. So for 30 years, that's a good gap. You know, you could say, well, it would be easy if I was Simon Peter and I saw Jesus. It could wear off after 30 years, just striving to live and being persecuted. And you know what? Everybody was hunting Christians down and killing people if they tried to believe. I mean, you could ask the same questions in many different doubt ways if you don't want to believe. Why is God with me? Where is God? Why would he start something and then allow it to have all these problems? And why is everybody coming at us? So he says here in, in verse 16, we did not follow clever devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from the Father, God the Father, when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. Now he reiterates, this is what happened in the gospels like 30 years ago when it was a young Simon Peter, and uh, God boomingly came out uh, uh, from the heavens in his voice and stamped it. And everybody heard it there too. Yeah. And he, verse 18, he says, we ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were called with him on the sacred mountain. And verse 20, it says here, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You know what? That promise there can change your whole life one way or the other. If you don't believe that, you're going to be looking and always wondering and really never believing fully in anything because you're going to have doubt. Like a lot of people look at the Bible today as a, a book or maybe it's written by some holy men or how do we know that God was in control of the whole thing? Yeah. And what's that going to do? Well, you still may be in a church, you still may strive, but you're not fully convinced. And if you're not fully convinced then you're not saved because faith without deeds is dead. Yeah. So you're sitting on the sideline always wondering. Come on. You know, you're on a stance where you're entertaining all kinds of conversations, but you don't step out on any of them. Yeah. So you're just like, you know, you're not, you're not really uh, making a, a step for you, not about for people. You're on the sidelines. Yeah. So it doesn't help you because unless you exercise your faith, Nothing will happen. Yeah. You'll just be thinking and intellectually talking and even reading the Bible all day. You're not going to get nothing. Yeah. See, if you don't read and obey, you don't see. Come on. Invisibles. Wow. Yes. But he says, above all, that's why he says it, above all. You don't get this, we can't move on. Verse 20, above all, yeah. you must understand. It's like, if whatever I've already said, if you don't believe this, it's worthless for you to move on. Right. He says all scripture is, is not by man. No one thought, oh, this is a good thing. Even if they were good things for people to do, it was not just like someone had the freedom, the Holy Spirit left them a little while, and they said, oh, I'll continue to read the next, I'll write this next several paragraphs, God, because I think I'm, I'm in the Spirit, and then come back, and then tune back into me. No, it, it's, all, it's all true. 
So now, if you go back to uh, in uh, back into Matthew 27, these people that died and came back to life, these were holy people died faithful in the old covenant. And it said they came, it says the bodies in verse 51 of Matthew 27, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. That means they didn't just raise and go back, die. They raised, lived, I don't know how much longer they lived, but then they had to die again. They died again. Wow. But it got people's attention. And that's why God did it. Amen. God said, listen, when I, when I go, when, when this happens, this is going to have to be something that's going to boom and keep booming. And everyone back then knew something significant had happened supernaturally. Yeah. And see, that's the same belief and power that someone can have when they really surrender and want to believe the truth. Amen. And even walking as a disciple, I appreciate Charles, what he shared. Thank you so much for your, yes. for your uh, communion. That was very humble, very powerful, because that's awesome. Yeah. It's great that we can be enjoying God, and we should enjoy God. What does it mean to enjoy God? Well, you should enjoy God. Why would God make laughter and kindness and even love? You, you, it's, it's pretty much enjoyment when you're in love. Yeah. If, 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 in love, meaning I'm not just talking about like uh, uh, eros love. I'm talking about agape love. Just yeah. lo around people that love you and it's, there's no judgment. That, that's enjoyable moments. Yes. See... Do, do, does it significant now? See, for me, wherever I'm at in life, I need to go, is it significant to me now? So I do, I push myself beyond what I probably would do if I didn't have the cross of Christ before me. Yeah. Why? Because I, 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 I really would go, who cares? Right. What's it matter? And it doesn't, I don't matter. But before God, he, he allows me to know when I'm in love with God and I'm walking with God, I do matter yeah. with God. Not that I'm more important than anybody, but that's incredible. That's why I do my best, because the greatest commandment is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. So that means he's going to give me strength to not baby myself. And why it's disputable, I don't compare it to anybody else. I just go, what can I do? And now, if I was in a sickness that might be contagious, I wouldn't be here. That would be selfish. But I am, you know, someone asked me how I'm doing. I think I was joking around. I feel like one of those guys in the Westerns. I have a bullet in me, but I'm still alive. <laughs> I used to come back from the acting days way back 40 years ago. I used to be, you know, and I used to, this, what I would carry this, this really miserable feelings I have right now and just weakness. I would try to hold it for the character later. Because when you really are feeling miserable, you can memory bring that back. Because it's like, so if I was in a Western, which I'm fantasizing right now, but I had a bullet in me. <laughs> you know, have you ever seen the Westerns where the guy's like, He's got a bullet in him, he's, he's, he's going for the good, he's trying to bring justice, but he's already been shot out with a few older guys, and he's like on the horse, it's toward the end of the movie, but he's still going, and he's just doing it like you, you're with him, you're like, get those bad guys, they're so terrible what they've done, you know, he's kind of on the horse, and you just know, how does he keep going with a bullet in him? There's a, there's a meaning to why he's going, and now, 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 now with us, we can go with Christ, in suffering. So let's continue to look at this. Be prepared to answer. Look in 1 Peter chapter 3. And you know, when Jesus yelled on the cross, when he said, Eli, Eli, Sama Batani, uh, why, and basically, why have you, then it's translated, why, my God, my God, why have you uh, aban forsaken me? It really means he's yelling out to God, why'd you abandon me? Now we're going, why would he yell with a question mark? Because the pain and the trauma of really the significance, which he could not prepare for, even though he's going to do it because he became human in every day. When he died on that cross for our sin, at that time, all the sin of people, he became the sin for us. And God turned his back on him because God cannot be in the presence of sin. The sacrifice was Jesus, and what he was dreading the most besides the beating and the brutality that happened to him was that moment what he screamed out, and I believe it was so shocking, even though he was dying for everyone, he knew it. It wasn't a pre-planned script. He'd never done that before. He never came, came down and became a man in every way. It's not like he was on an auto-robot program thing. Now be the son of God. Be a human. Go through the motions. No, he, he was tempted in every way. He, was, yeah. he, he, he felt everything. He says he was tempted in every way, meaning you can't say, I don't un he doesn't understand my situation. Yeah, he does. 
He understands pain, suffering, and he also understands the pain of not being close to God. Yeah. Even though he never sinned, he became sin. That's why he went by, and he screamed it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's like, oh, it was so painful. The fact of the moment when God had to turn away from him, he was all alone. It was, yeah. it was shocking to him. So look in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Forever would love life and see good days, days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So that's going to happen, right? People are going to talk maliciously and bad about you because you're such a good little Christian, such a good little church person. You're going to go to your church people again? You're going to go hang out? You're going to get persecuted. You know, you're going to, what's that about? No, when you become a true disciple, even people that thought they were disciples that aren't are going to go, you love them more than me. All that stuff comes out and you just have to go, Forgive him, Father, for he does not know what he knows right now. And it says here, gentle, and then it says in verse 17, for it's better if you do God's will to suffer for doing good than doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. To bring you to God. That's pretty awesome. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in Christ, in the spirit, made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism. That now saves you also. Not the removal of the dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven, is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, powers, and submission to him. So, so you know, I know we're reading that, and every, a lot of times, I know whenever, when most people get to... Uh, the part where it says, you know, he, he was put to death but made alive in the spirit, and then he went and made proclamations to the imprisoned spirits. I think most minds go, wow, that's deep. <laughs> you know, that is deep. That means there's a lot more going on beyond the death of the grave. Yes. Humanistically, there's a lot going on. There's a full spiritual life after death. Oh, yeah. And there's a battle after death, too. And God won, but you got to realize... Get busy living or get busy dying. Oh, wow. And that's, that's point one. Okay. Wow. Get busy living, get busy dying. That's why I get up because when I get with Christ, I, don't, I, I go, why not? I'll have enough time to not worry about baby myself when my physicalities go to a point where I can't do it. Then I'll regret pushing myself and showing up with people because that's a great thing to do when you can do it. And if you look at the thing here is that be prepared to give an answer. Yes. Always be prepared to give an answer to the hope you have. Now, and to the reasons for the hope you have. That's a long, that, that's deep if you continue to answer those questions about it. Yeah. Yes, it, it involves Jesus died for me on the cross, but it must be more. Because what does that open into to your life? How does that bring joy? How does that bring hope? How does that bring perseverance? How does that bring mental perspective on challenging times? That's the hope that continues to rewire by your faith. Because when you're down and out, like Charles was, was talking about, not down and out, but just going through a really hard time, as a Christian, right. saying, I don't, I'm struggling majorly, but continuing to persevere. Come on. That's what we're talking about.
you know, when I was walking in here, I appreciate the church. Thank you for praying for me for yesterday. And, uh, you know, yesterday, if I was like yesterday, I wouldn't have been here. I could not move. I could not move from one chair to the other. I mean, my legs, uh, I'm on a cane now, but sometimes my legs uh, get so bad, I can't, I can't even barely walk. I don't know. Sometimes it's up and down. You know, it's really weird. But uh, what's my hope? My hope is to do an attitude adjustment and continue to do attitude adjustments when my attitude's bad, unspiritual, feeling sorry for myself, not wanting to be warm and fuzzy or friendly, wanting to be alone. Alone in a rough, it's good to be alone in the, you know, the healthy loan zone. But if you want to be alone more than being alone, when you know it's not really good now, you've passed that, there's something wrong, why am I isolating? That's not good. That's the danger zone. That's not a healthy. What is the reason I give hope? Well, I always try to see the positive and, 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 and then also knowing that I will, this life is temporary. But get busy living or get busy dying. Let's look at Romans 7, 14. You know, toward the end, I'm, I'm going to ask some of the, any of the members to possibly come up and just share. Uh, uh, because I was thinking that line we said, be prepared to give an answer for the hope. One of these Sundays, I may not prepare anybody for communion and just introduce it and say, now I want someone to come up and share communion. Honestly, if you're walking with God, you should be able to share because that's your, that's your whole reasons why you're doing things. That's your reasons why you're walking and living and attitude adjusting throughout the day. The cross. And, you, and, and how can you not go back to your darkness and your sin? But how can you not go back to right now and who you were this week? See, I feel like I'm, I'm dying if I don't stay in the cross because even the best I try to do, I feel so much like a wretch. And then I read what Paul writes here and I feel, Whoo, well, at least he can understand. Or I can understand. I'm glad he understands. I'm glad we understand. But look, look in uh, Romans uh, chapter 7, verse 14. See, when he wrote this, when I was a young Christian, I remember I thought he was writing this to non-Christians. And the minister that was... Uh, the brother that was in the church with me said, no, no, this is written, this is Paul being honest after he was saved. Yeah. I was like, wow, how can he, you know, in my mind, I was like, what? I thought you were not going to struggle like this. No, this is the real deal. Yeah. And it says in verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, slow to, slow to save sin. You know, I'm telling you, the longer I walk with God, the more I realize what Paul said, I am unspiritual. And I don't try to make excuses, but that's just what you are, even if you're in Christ. See, you're unspiritual. And if you don't understand that's your hope, you don't become more spiritual after you're saved. You become more faithful. You become more moved and strive to be in the grace and the hope. And you become more humble because you realize, oh my gosh, I'm still a wretch. You're not making excuses, but look at that. Now look in verse 15. I do not understand what I do. Who can, that's so powerful. Every one of you could go this past week, some conversation or some comment or thought you could say in Christ and for Christ, I don't understand why I did that. Yeah. Now, hopefully you, you said sorry, Amen. but you're still, you can relate to that, can't you? Yeah. And it says, for what I want to do, I do not do. Yeah. But what I hate, I do. There was a piece of cake out on the table. <laughs> And when we had Bible talk, they passed it already around. And I had a little sliver. But then whenever he left, that other piece on the cake. And then why would we go eat that other cake? That other piece? Because no one's looking. And, and by the way, you don't, why, do you, why, why do we, we're adults. We don't even ask for permission. But sometimes when we want to do something, we, you know, you just don't want to hear it. But that's already your consequence. You're not, it's not like a law. You can't eat that other cake. But you know it's probably not good for you yeah. to overeat. And immediately after you do that, you feel, oh, why did I do that? <laughs> For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. Verse 16, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. For I, but I thought Jesus died for all our sin. How is it still living in you? Because yeah. you're unspiritual. <laughs> That's what you are. That's what I am. Be joyful. If you know you're unspiritual, you're holding on to the hope and the grace of God is moving you to repent and you're going to become amazingly stronger and more righteous if you could just understand no matter what you're unspiritual, but God wants to move you and help you and use you. Amen. Sometimes we start playing, we get cleaned up too much and we play church people. 
Now you've just forgot you're still unspiritual. Now strive to be the best you can with the power of God. But don't start, you know, playing some actress or actor. I'm so spiritual. So if you look down, so uh, I do not want to do, do what I want. So when you, when, before you become a Christian, you did whatever you wanted to do. Yeah. Even though you felt shame and guilt, you kept doing it. Right. So this is the difference. Now you're, being, now you're being convicted, and it's challenging to realize you still struggle with things. Yeah. As many of you know, I've shared that I'm trying to get on my knees, and I haven't been, the first time I did it again was after 13 months, and it's very hard. It's very hard. I'm in a lot of pain when I go down, and I have to grab things and lean. But then I start thinking, what have I got down on my knees for in life? Well, if I lost my wallet, even if I dropped a, if you, if I had an expensive ring and I dropped it in the toilet, my hand would go in and get it out. <laughs> or if I dropped it behind a public restroom, I'd get on my knees and get it. If it, you know, you would too if it was like your Rolex or something. I also got on my knees after being up partying all night on cocaine and then we're out and then I was looking for little white specks in the carpet because I thought that might be one thing that we maybe spilled and I need to get that and I'm on my knees getting lent or anything because I'm out of my mind. I'm psycho. And I crawled around on my knees looking for that extra bit of drugs. That was in, that was 1993 and prior. So I realized I'm unspiritual. I'm really grateful to get on my knees because I need help. Yeah. And in verse 19, it says, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, Ooh, this I keep doing. You can even hear Paul struggling. Yeah. Oh. Don't compare sins. And let go of what I just shared with you because you're like, good night, the pastor just shared that. <laughs> Crawling around looking for little cocaine rocks. Well, praise God, I know I'm unspiritual, but, but guess what? You're as unspiritual as I am because what's, what sin does not separate you from God? Yeah. Unrepented sin. Yeah. So, for what I do not do, and then it says in verse 20, now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. You know, if you just took that out of context, you could really blame shift and go, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's this sinful, this sinful part of me that just I can't control it. You understand it's not me. I can't help it. Yet you can't do that. You can be honest, but then you're going to see what the rest of it says. Own it, but don't stay there like there's no hope because that's, there wouldn't be any hope if we, if we had prepared to give an answer to why we believe. Think about it. If you couldn't change anything, but you're still supposed to be humble and talk about it. Well, I'm sending it up, but I can't change it. That's, so nothing's changed. I have no hope. That'd be crazy. And it says here in verse 20, uh, 20 through, 20, uh, 1, it says, So I find the law, th that this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil's right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Now, right there, you could stop in those two verses and be a, what I would call, an unhappy Christian. Showing up at everything, coming, but you're never good enough, and it's never, you're always just conflicted by how bad you are. That's another not right. That's unrighteous. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually unrighteous to think like that. Yeah. Get cut by your sin, but grace is to acknowledge it, go, God, help me change it, forgive me, and then move forward like it never happened again, and really live like it's not going to happen again. Be humble, be open, go, I need help. This is what I struggle in. Don't just stay uh, quiet up because if you keep doing the same thing over and over and not changing and just letting God know, that doesn't show humility. Yeah. See, God will forgive you, but he, he wants to see humility. That's why he says, confess your sins to one another. Pull people in that, that, that are in the battle with you and go, I'm struggling this. Can you pray for me? When someone says that to me, you know what I do? I see him again. I say, hey, man, I prayed for you, number one, because I've got to remember praying. And then I go, how's it going? How are you doing now? 
And then if he says, oh, I did it again, I'm going to say, you're such a fool. Don't have me waste my prayers on you again. Go to somebody else. I expected you not to sin again. No. I go, amen, bro. Wow. How do you feel about that? Well, you know what? That's why the hope we have. You can do this. What's going on in your life? Let's just talk through it. Maybe, uh, maybe you can think of some boundaries or something, whatever you're struggling with. Come on. Right. Let this go. Let's just go. Let's get back up. You can do this. For the Lord died for you. Come on. That's what you need to do. Yeah. But he says here, thanks be to God. After that, after that, thinking, oh, my gosh, who's going to rescue me? Well, it was me. And then he goes, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord, exclamation point. And then, so then I remind myself, my, I, I, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. That's why we have the words of God. I feel I've been a disciple since 1993. I've had ups and downs and all arounds. I've never walked away from God but I've definitely been in a sinful place with God. And even now, I was telling Sonia, it's like even when I'm doing well with God, what I mean by doing well, there's no deliberate sin that I know of. I'm going, God, help search me. The, David said that in the mornings and in the evenings. God, I want to have a clear conscience. Is there anything I need to work on that I don't even know? Yeah. Help me strive to not obey because of obedience, but because I want my heart, I want to give my whole heart to you. And that's yeah. what obedience to God is. I want to give my whole heart. But even when I'm doing that well, then I feel like, man, I'm such a wretch. I feel so just, I, and, and then I have to keep going back, God, forgive me, because I have challenges still mentally, emotionally, and physically. Yeah. So why I change is, is I have to go back and go, I'm joyful, and I have to understand grace even more. But you know what it does? It keeps me close to God because I know God loves me. And you have to keep reading that because it's not an excuse. But you've got to realize God loves you, saved you by grace. Why? You wouldn't need grace if you were, weren't unspiritual. Yeah. And it's not to make an excuse. It's, it, it should motivate you by the love of God to want to be freed from these things that God calls sin because we're not happy about it anyway. An atheist that does the behaviors the Bible calls sin is not happy. They may not claim a God. They may talk about, the, they call it the universe or whatever, but they're not happy. Right. Not resolving conflict in relationships does not make you happy. You continue to estrange, and even people you have to be around, you're really not close because there's invisible vibes, and it just feels weird. Go to Thanksgiving with your family for 20 years, and you're already regretting going. You're like, how am I going to move her around Uncle Joe or Frank? You know, oh, it's just not resolved. That stinks. Yeah. And even when you did things that you regret and you can't take back, unless you bring it before God, it eats you up. It's called shame. Without forgiveness and without God, yeah. the guilt turns into shame because there's nothing to do with it except just keep it secret. And the Bible says you're only as sick as your secrets. Mm. Let's look at 2 Timothy 2, 8. What a wretched man. So you should look at that and go, wow, and not go, what's he struggling with? Go, that's Apostle Paul, one of the most fired up, useful tools, imperfect human being for God. Wow. He's so humble, he even talk, he talks about how bad he was as an unspiritual, sinful man. Amen. And now he, on his best, he still says, man, only by God I can, I can make it. I'm wretched. But then you realize you don't look down on yourself. You realize, oh, my gosh, I can't believe how loved I am by God. Amen. He loves me no matter who I am. But it... it, 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 it like my wife, she makes me want to be a better man. I don't mean she looks at me with a gun and says, you better be a better man. <laughs> By who she is to me and how she loves me and watching her with other people and how she treats other people and how she is not afraid to address conflict or to call people out and help them grow and change. And then how she is with me. I, can, I say thank you so much because she's had to, overcompensate for my injuries with me. She makes me want to be a better man. That's what that means. You know what I mean? So with God and what he's done for me, God makes me want to be a better man. And women, that's what you should be able to say. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better wife. I want to be a better daughter. I want to be a better son. And, and it's not like you have to be fake and it's not like you feel guilty. It just calls you to capture your thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. Let me ask you this. How you respond is who you are. 
and you're saved by grace, but are you changing and working on things that you know maybe have a way, a pattern? Yeah. Irritableness, criticalness, harsh, anger. These things you should capture and go, this is who I am. You guys can shut that door because I think it's hotter outside, isn't it? Or is the AC on? Is the AC on? What's... All right, good. Keep that AC cranking. How you doing? <laughs> Second Timothy, uh, what is it, February? Florida. Keep that AC cranking. Everybody else on the other parts of the country are like, what? Uh, in 2 Timothy 2, it says, remember, 2 Timothy 2, 8, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Yeah, well, it's, it just sits in a lot of people's houses on a shelf with dust on it. So it's my, it might as well be chained because it's not. But how, it's the most sold book and the least read book in the world. So why it's not chained? Well, what does that mean? That means that people that become true Christians need to carry that word in their gentleness as they share the hope from what Jesus did. And then hopefully people could want to look into the scriptures. Because it's not like it's chained up in a secret box. But think about that. God's saying, hey, I want it to be moved. I want people to want to ask and look at the scriptures and be honest and humble and go, really, am I a Christian? Do I even know if I am? I just grew up and Aunt Mary said I was. Aunt Joe. Or friend. Am I really? How do I know I'm right with God? Well, go to God's word and help somebody help you be honest with it. And then take ownership of all false, false doctrine. I don't care if you grew up believing anything that's in, not in the Bible. Guess what? It just cancels out what, where you're at. Now it's just humility or you're going to be stubborn and emotional and you don't want to hurt your family tree because this is what they believed. What the heck? You're going to be afraid to, 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 to not hurt someone's feelings if they're living in, incorrectly from the word of God? You just need to gently say, look what I found. I don't even, do you understand? Ask them to explain it. Why is this in here? What's that mean? And let's just break that chain. In verse 10, it says, therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. See, coming here today for disciples or showing up anytime when you're not feeling like it is really knowing it's bigger than you. You're already saved. If you're a saved Christian, why show up or do anything if you're saved by grace? Because you now have the love of God and you realize now I'm compelled. Like Paul says, I do everything for the sake of the elect. That means others that God has earmarked that have not been reached out to yet. So if we don't continue to be moved by the grace of God to do works of God, not be saved by works, but share our faith, be willing to get in there, show up on Sunday, fired up with love, midweeks, Bible talks. They devoted themselves every day in the, Old Test in the New Testament church. We, we need to connect and be there. Why? By their love. By our love, by the disciples' love, people will know and maybe have questions. Not that we're better than anybody, but God changes you beyond what you can do. Yes. So he says, the elect. That's why I seek first the kingdom. That's why I'm devoted. It's not rules. Yes. The Bible's not rules to me. If the Bible's rules, you haven't understood. Right. It's love. Yes. He says here in 11, this is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we also live with him. If we endure we also will reign with him. If we disown him, he will disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Okay? Very powerful points. Uh, if we died with him, died with him, we will also live with him. That's an awesome fact. Yes. My so my rinkety body with the painful... An analysis of like bullet in me. It's not a bullet in me, but I'm really hurting. I'm not complaining. I'm, I'm here. Amen. Not because I have to. It's for me and for God. My heart says, I will suffer. It's nothing compared to you, but I'm going to be here. And if everybody lives like that, what kind of church are we going to have? Come on. All around the world. Come on. Suffering. I'm going to use the word that can be used. It's stinks. It's terrible when you're doing it. 
suffering. It's just terrible. When you're hurting and you got the flu or you're really sick or you broke your leg and you're suffering, it's never, it's, it's like that. your mind can just go, Shh. but as a Christian, you got to grasp that suffering and go, who am I with the suffering? That's why he gave it to us. But look what it says here. If we endure, we will also reign with him. What's it mean to endure? That means you may not endure. If you don't keep going and don't do your part, just like a marriage. One says, I don't want to really attempt to make it happen anymore. I don't want to work on it. I'm done. Then the endure, then you can't have a marriage. It's going to end. Even if you just can't. Two people need to be willing to talk and work it out and continue to say hard times, sin against us. Are you going to endure for the sake of the marriage? Are you going to endure with God? Because if you don't endure, there's a problem. God already did all he can do. He can't do any more than he already did. So you must endure so you can reign with him. And then it says, if we disown him, he disowns us. Wow. That's walk away and not be willing to repent and get help. That's not grace. That's defiance. Grace doesn't work in that, span, that stance. Right. Verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. See, if you're faithless, that's God's loves you. That means you really are struggling. It doesn't mean you have an attitude. It doesn't mean you don't even want to do well. You want help. You're humble. You're going to crawl. You may be carried like the footprints. Remember that footprints poem I ever saw where Jesus yeah, said, yeah. and the guy said, you left me. There's two, foot, there's two people walking. I'm not there. Where's me? And he goes, I was carrying you. Because you couldn't even walk. That's the issue. When you can't, but you want to, God will be with you. Yes. You can't leave God if you're willing. But if, you're, if you decide to disown him, that's, that's a decision to go, I'm done. You can't decide that. So I'd like to have uh, some, let's have a couple people uh, who would like to share about what to, uh, let's go back to that theme scripture, 1 Peter 3. 10, uh, 15, it says, but in your hearts, revere God, Christ as Lord. You see how it's Lord before Savior? Yeah. I want you to make sure you understand it. It's not, Savior's awesome, and that needed to happen, but it says, revere him as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. So it's personalized. It's personalized. So uh, let's do Earl, and uh, let's have Paula, and then we'll see how we do on time. It was a great message, and it was a lot of, a lot of little stings and cuts and gut punches. And um, brother, I love how you stand up here week after week. Yes. And, and I mean, you can look at you. You can see it. You can see it in your eyes. You're tired. And you can also see when you're working and how you're picking up steam as you go. And you've said it week after week. Well, you know what I don't want to. I stand here, and I get stronger as I go. And I, I think it's a great inspiration. It, at least it is for me. Um, you know, we had talked the other day about you saying, I'm just going to come up on a Sunday and say, I'm going to call somebody for communion. And I was like, man, that's a great idea. And I was telling Parker, I was like, what if he stood up today and said, I'm calling somebody for communion? And I'd feel like maybe at school, I'm like, I'm sliding down in my seat a little bit. You know, don't make eye contact. You know, the teacher's going to call on you. And then, and then I knew that was wrong. But then you said today, well, maybe I'll stand up there and I'll just ask for a volunteer. And in the back, I thought, yes. Because I know Chaz will raise his hand. I know Chamba's going to raise his hand. I know somebody else will raise their hand. So, you know, I could kind of like sit in the back. But then there it was. How I respond is who I am. And that's not the response I want to give. The Bible is the most sold book and least read. Well, what good is it for me if I read it and I don't live it? So I appreciate that charge. It was a charge for me that I, I need to be bold and I need to live the word. So I appreciate it. Appreciate it, brother. So after Earl came, I said, if I have to follow him, I don't want to go. <laughs> but, um, but this is a great scripture and... Um, uh, a lot of you who are members of the church know the struggle I'm going through in my marriage, but um, with, my, with prayer, with, with discipling, with the word, with the spirit, um, with um, 
repentance and everything else that goes along with being a disciple, um, God gives me hope to be at peace. You know, I used to struggle with anxiety and I've had a couple panic attacks and uh, been diagnosed and things like that. But I am not on any medication. I don't even drink alcohol anymore. And, uh, and it's really been amazing that I can have 100% most, you know, like normally I'm at peace. I can't say perfect peace, but I'm normally at peace. And I know it's because my hope rests in Jesus. And every day I keep renewing that as I get on my knees and as I pray and, and uh, I just open myself up to all of you. So, amen. Man, this was a fire lesson, Chris. I am just so fired up that you came. And I know, you know, I was reaching out, but um, this challenge is, is, is so cool. You know, in our hearts, we revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared. You know, for me, I think... I've been struggling, like, with, (laughs) with, you know, just, like, sharing my faith. Like, um, Chris and I, we had a long talk last Tuesday, and he hammered me, but he didn't, out of love. But I I just wasn't as hopeful in people as I wanted to be, because I started to see people and get Cynical. cynical, yes, but also, like, there's another word. It's almost like righteous, self-righteous. Oh, yeah. Because I look at the kingdom and, I, you know, the kingdom's my treasure. Everyone knows and knows every week we, we have staff, the kingdom, right? So just all your faces. Guys, you have, I just wanted to say welcome to Karen and Chris, you guys again. You guys, believe it or not, you're a really big piece of my good news for sure. Because as the self-righteous, I go out and share my faith, and, you know, I think it comes out of me, but at the same time, when, when you share the scripture, be prepared to give an answer, you know, because I, I go out, share, I love sharing my faith with people, and I love the, uh, you know, the, the reaction of, hey, we have an opportunity to serve God and, and, and to give God glory and, and see the wonderful things that he did in my life. I can go on and on about everything he's done, starting with my marriage and my awesome wife. So I just want to lift you up, wife, you're excellent. Amy. <laughs> but... But for me, I, you know, I haven't had any, for myself, I started to question, like, man, I'm out sharing my faith, no visitors, things like that. Like, what's going on? So you guys are a big part of my hope. I want you to know that, you know. And it, it's awesome to see someone respond, like, wow, you know what? Yes. And it's great. Like, you know, and I'm always out sharing my faith. So that's, that's a big joy for me because God is, a, we, we have such an awesome God and we have so, uh, an almighty Lord. So. Yeah. I started to think to myself, man, man, you know, uh, sharing my faith, it's faith building. This hope that I have is just like, wow, look what God did and what he continues to do. So, you know, I appreciate this lesson, Chris. I appreciate you coming out and, and giving your whole heart, your humbleness and your openness and your vulnerability. So it's so motivating to bring it back to, you know, I, I need God. And I can't be the self-righteous person. <laughs> and just keep sharing out of place. Chris's, Chris's lesson to me was love. He said, listen, you were that same person, which is so true. I was the same self-righteous, hypocritical person. <laughs> but thank you, brother. It's been awesome. So thanks. For... <laughs> I appreciate that. From time to time, you know, I'm not going to put anybody in the spot, but I, I love to hear that because... You don't have to have a right answer. You just need to go, I'm fighting. I'm walking in life. You, you, know, what, you know what I was going to say as we come in for landing is you're not saved by works, but you, you are saved by faith, and faith without deeds is dead. So showing up in anything shows the love. Let's talk about, you know, single moms. Well, I'm not trying to throw men under the bus, but whoever left the relationship and abandoned the family, Or it's single, you know, a spouse, you have children, but there's people all over the world that do that. It's like they're not there on their commitment, not only to their spouse, but not even for children. I don't care what the reasons are. They stop showing up. The hurt, maybe there's two that hurt each other in the relationship, doesn't matter. The kids, to show up and do what's right and work your bones extra because you're going to support financially and send that child support. That's not easy, but that's right. When Jesus was carrying the cross, 
He fell because he could not do it anymore. He was emotionally dehydrated, physically dehydrated, emotionally in shock from the beating and the blood that lost. So they had to get a onlooker named Simon of Cyrene pull out. We know this in the gospel. Why? Because Jesus, you think he really just said, uh, I'm just going to give up right now? You think he would have kept carrying that 110-pound part of the cross if he could have? Yeah. yeah, he's not going to be that. He went down. He couldn't do it. They got someone else and said, let's keep going. And he got up and followed or walked in front of, I'm not sure which one, still to where he was going to be nailed to the cross. Yeah. That's showing up. He didn't need grace. He, need, he showed love by showing up as a human being. He kept going when he was beaten to almost half, to so dead he couldn't even barely make it the rest of the way. Yeah. That's the same thing. That's love. love. Faith without deeds is dead. Intellectually going, I love God, but not stepping up and wanting to help yourself find God first. And then when you get right with God, and then you understand on the other side of that coin is you don't just live now, save, do whatever you want. You're enjoying God, but now whatever you do is a platform and you show up for God, not can I do it or not? No, God, can you give me the strength to do it? Showing up is love. You're not earning it, but that's what you do because it's not easy. And if it's not worth it, you won't do it. But the cross, it always goes back cross. Is it worth it? Why do I do what I do? Because Jesus died for me. Amen. The unspiritual man. Now I'm an unspiritual saved man versus an unspiritual non-saved man. But the difference is perspective now. I'm striving to follow and imitate Jesus. So I recognize and want to know the sins instead of secretly hide them. I want to show up. I want to change it. I'm not going to ever get tired of overcoming and fighting my sin, being humble to people, asking for help, and not being worried what people think, but just go, I want to be less unspiritual. And to God be the glory. Amen. Amen.